Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, me here today. My name is Chris Murphy. I have the honor of representing Connecticut in the United States uh, Senate. Uh, and uh, I wanted to uh, say a few brief words uh, today about the new crisis uh, enveloping the country surrounding uh, the president's attempt to use a foreign government to try to manipulate the 2020 elections. Uh, I'm happy at the uh, conclusion of these remarks to answer other questions, including those about the status of uh, background checks negotiations with uh, the White House uh, as well. Um, I think this is the most serious moment of the Trump administration to date. Uh, the president is openly admitting to having asked a foreign government to interfere in the 2020 elections. The president has admitted to pressing uh, the new president of Ukraine to investigate one of his political opponents. And he has also dispatched his political fixer, Rudy Giuliani, to try to close the deal. Uh, this is unacceptable in a democracy. No president of the United States can use his office, can use the national security apparatus of this country to try to interfere in an election, to try to destroy his political opponents. That this cannot happen in this country. And if it is indeed true, uh, Congress can't allow it to stand. Uh, I had heard um, several months ago that the new Ukrainian president was deeply concerned and confused about the pressure he was getting from the Trump administration to uh, commence an investigation uh, against the Biden family. And so I went to Ukraine several weeks ago to meet with the new president to talk to him about these concerns. Uh, indeed, uh, once I got on the ground there, I heard about how confused the entire new Ukrainian administration was uh, about the nature of these demands they were getting from the Trump administration to conduct this political investigation, and that they worried that the aid that was being cut off uh, to Ukraine by the president was a consequence for their unwillingness at the time to investigate the Bidens. Uh, they were unwilling to conduct this investigation because there was no merit to it. Uh, the Ukrainian prosecutors uh, saw no reason to investigate. And every media outlet that had looked at the charges that the president was levying were deemed to uh, be um, uh, false. Um, and so I heard when I was in Ukraine uh, from the president directly um, his concern about why the aid was being cut off to Ukraine. The president also told me he had no interest in interfering in a U.S. election. Um, what is happening now is that the president is admitting that he pressed the Ukrainians to conduct these political investigations because he thinks he can get away with it. The president thinks he can act with impunity. I don't think it really matters whether there was a quid pro quo. I don't think it really matters whether the president explicitly told the Ukrainians that they wouldn't get their security aid if they didn't uh, interfere in the 2020 elections. There is an implicit threat in every single demand that a United States president makes of a foreign power, especially a country like Ukraine that is so dependent on the United States. Every time the American president asks a foreign country to do something, that foreign country knows that if they don't do it, there are likely going to be consequences. And so it doesn't matter whether the president specifically linked the investigation of his political opponent to the withholding of the aid. Um, even if he simply asked a foreign power to interfere in our elections, that would be unacceptable in and of itself. We just spent a year trying to figure out if the president invited the Russians to interfere in the uh, 2016 elections. Had the Mueller investigation uncovered a phone call between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin 
in which Donald Trump asked Vladimir Putin eight different times to interfere in the 2016 election. That would be the smoking gun that Republicans and Democrats had been waiting for. And so the question is, does it really matter that that phone call simply occurred with a different country? Um, I'm going to give some real thought over the next few days about what to do about this. I think it's important for us to get as much information as we can. The whistleblower's complaint needs to be sent to Congress. There is no discretion allowed by the administration on the matter of whether this whistleblower complaint uh, is sent to Congress. The law commands the administration to send serious whistleblower complaints to Congress, and the executive branch needs to do that ASAP. Um, I know the obvious question is whether the House should proceed with impeachment proceedings. I have been reluctant to recommend impeachment to the House um, for a few reasons, um, one of which is that I you know, haven't been convinced that uh, senators should be providing recommendations to the House on what is essentially um, their sole prerogative. Um, but I'm going to give some serious thought uh, to, to, to my uh, position on this matter in the coming days, uh, because I, I don't know how I live in a country, I help lead a country that allows a president of the United States to openly admit to this kind of corruption uh, and get away with it. Uh, so um, I will leave it there, uh, and I'm happy to also answer some questions on uh, the status of uh, background checks negotiations as well. It was. So um, I so I I have been long involved in U.S. Ukraine relations, um, in large part because we have a strong Ukrainian American population here in Connecticut, and, and that Ukrainian American population is deeply invested in making sure that the U.S. Ukraine uh, relationship remains. Um, bipartisan. They want to make sure that Republicans and Democrats support Ukraine and that there's no politics involved in uh, U.S. support for Ukraine. And that was in part why I brought John McCain here to Connecticut years ago. Uh, he and I did a joint forum uh, on the importance of bipartisan support for Ukraine. So, I, so I've gotten to know uh, a lot of leaders in Ukraine, uh, and I started to hear from them uh, in the springtime, shortly after President Zelensky was sworn into office that he was getting pressure from Trump political operatives to begin an investigation into the Biden family. Um, I uh, fairly immediately sent a letter to the Foreign Relations Committee uh, asking the committee to open an investigation uh, into these claims and concerns. At the time, Giuliani was openly admitting that he was having these discussions, so it wasn't a state secret. Uh, the Foreign Relations Committee declined to open that investigation. I continued to hear those concerns uh, over the course of the next several months. I raised them repeatedly with my Republican colleagues, uh, and then I finally made the decision to visit Ukraine for myself to have uh, some of these conversations. Um, I'm, I'm going back to this issue of uh, impeachment. Will you be making a public declaration by the end of this week that you either support impeachment or you're not? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have a. I don't have a time frame for it. I, I think in the past, um, to be honest, my reluctance to um, recommend impeachment has been uh, first due to my you know, question as to the proper role of senators. Um, in recommending action to the House, uh, but uh, also um, my, um, uh, my question as to whether there was sufficient public support uh, for such an endeavor. Um, but I, you know, I've always weighed those concerns against the seriousness of the actions from the administration. I think for me it's always been a balancing act of um, reasons uh, to withhold a recommendation for impeachment um, against the gravity of the actions by the administration. And certainly um, this weekend's disclosures make the gravity of the abuse by the White House uh, even more serious, and that will factor into 
you know, the decision that, that, that I make in terms of my public position on this matter. Have the authority to indict the House. Does. The House, so the House, so the House, right? So uh, the, the Senate ultimately would be the juror, uh, and and the House, we we ultimately will have nothing to say about impeachment unless the uh, House votes to send uh, the matter to the United States Senate. Now that has not stopped some of my other Senate colleagues from making recommendations to the House. Um, that is not improper. Uh, I just have not done that uh, as of uh, as of yet. So Isn't there the visit? concern that uh, if there is a full-blown impeachment investigation, that it just helps him with his base in the election next year? I mean, in, you know, in, in, impeachment is a political process. It's not a legal process. So um, it's not... Uh, it's not out of bounds to consider the political implications of impeachment, given that it is a political uh, process. Um, I, 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 ju I just worry that the president is daring um, this country to hold him in check. I, I, I just, I was, you know, I, I thought it was extraordinary that the president admitted to the country that he had engaged in a fundamental corruption of his office. He did that, I believe, because he thinks that he acts with impunity these days. And we've all got to consider, uh, you know, can, can consider that. And I have talked with um, Democratic and Republican senators this weekend, and I think that I'm not saying that there are Republicans that are going to recommend impeachment, but there is concern from both Republicans and Democrats in the Senate that the president is engaging in um, inactivity that raises uh, new levels of concern. Did the president release a transcript of this uh, phone call or some sort of redacted transcript of this phone call? He should, um, but I think the first, I think what's, what's important first is for this whistleblower complaint to be sent to Congress. I mean, there's, there's no legal question around uh, whether the whistleblower complaint has to be sent to Congress. But remember, the, what we know is that the sum total of the president's pressure campaign on Zelensky is not contained in that one phone call. Uh, I mean, the president has um, been sending political representatives to the Zelensky government since the spring uh, to try to pressure them to do his political work. Uh, so we also shouldn't believe that, um, that that one phone call between Trump and Zelensky represents the, um, the full scope of the administration's actions to try to get the Ukrainians to interfere in the elections. Remember, Pompeo was asked yesterday um, whether the State Department itself had facilitated these uh, uh, these demands of the Ukrainians to investigate Trump's political opponents, and he would not answer that question. So it is, it is very possible that um, the State Department itself has been involved in this conspiracy. But putting that phone call aside, do you really believe that there's no merit whatsoever to investigating the Vice President's connection to Ukraine, given what we know about him? going to that country in 2016 and trying to oust the top prosecutor that led an investigation into the oil company. I mean, this has been debunked by everyone that has looked into it. Um, the, the prosecutor at the time was corrupt through and through. Everyone was asking the Ukrainians to get rid of him. Uh, the IMF was asking the Ukrainians to get rid of him. The Americans, the French, the British, the EU. It was an open and shut case that this prosecutor was uh, was corrupt and and had to go. Vice President Biden was making the same ask of the Ukrainians that everyone else was asking. Uh, so uh, you know this is um, you know th this this is simply a, a a a political creation of the White House that, by the way, morphs by the hour. I mean, yesterday the Secretary of State was on TV accusing Vice President Biden of election interference. I mean, what, what does he mean? Whose election is he alleging that Vice President Biden interfered in? The Ukrainian election? Is he alleging that Vice President Biden interfered in the 2016 election? I mean, it, it's, it's a sign of how there is no connection between the things that this administration says about Joe Biden or anything else and the truth. And, you know, Pompeo said, claimed the, the vice president, yes, yesterday Pompeo claimed the vice president interfered in an election. And no one seems to be outraged by that. 
No one seems to be asking questions of Pompeo today. What is the nature of the allegation that the Secretary of the State of the United States just lev levied against the former, uh, the former Vice President? But it's a sign of how loose they are playing with the truth. You had heard that the president of Ukraine was confused about the aid and why it wasn't coming, and so that's why you went there. Where did you, who told you that? How did you hear about this? So, I mean, I just, I, I, I'm not going to disclose all of the private conversations I have. You know, what he said on the phone calls. But, but it's absolutely logical that the, listen, I don't need people to verify for me that a foreign leader would be confused when they are getting um, overtures from political representatives of the president. Um, we don't do that in this country. We don't have campaign operatives of the president of the United States traveling the world asking foreign governments to interfere in American elections. And if you were a foreign leader, it stands to reason you would be slightly flummoxed if you got a visit from the president's personal lawyer asking you to conduct investigations into candidates that are running against him. So yes, I had confirmation from people that visited me from Ukraine telling me that this was an issue. But I, I mean, frankly, you don't need that confirmation. It's obviously a problem if the president is sending his campaign operatives around the world trying to get foreign governments to manipulate American po politics. Any confidences, if you can, what exactly did Zelensky say to you? I, I've been pretty open about what Zelensky said to me. So Zelensky opened the meeting by raising concerns about this money being withheld. Um, so he was deeply concerned about the I impact that it would have on Ukrainian security to lose this military funding. Um, and uh, then later in the meeting, uh, I raised with him specifically the issue of Rudy Giuliani's overtures to uh, him and his team. At the time, uh, I didn't know that the president has ra had raised this directly with Zelensky. Uh, I, you know, I cautioned him that by getting involved in the 2020 election, uh, he was going to potentially destroy um, the bipartisan nature of the U.S.-Ukraine relationship, and, and and after watching what we had just gone through and trying to discover whether Russia was involved in the 2016 election, the last thing Ukraine should want is to be the subject of investigations as to their role in the 2020 election. Um, he gave me a very strong answer. Um, he was ready for the question. Uh, he told me that uh, he had no interest in getting involved in the 2020 election, that he understood the damage it would do to the U.S.-Ukraine relationship if he did get involved. Uh, and I left, you know, very confident that he was going to reject the overtures from the administration. Um, and I was glad, uh, I was glad about it. So when was, can I just put together some of a timeline? Yep. So the conversation that, um, the conversation in question with Trump happened sometime on July 25th? July 25th. And so uh, your visit to the Ukraine Early September, so the week of Labor Day. Okay. So, so much later. So, I mean, I was there, uh, you know, over a over over a month uh, over a month later. I forget. Were you with any other members of Congress on that? Senator interview? Ron Johnson. Has Senator Johnson been getting some of the same concerns from the Ukrainians? Has he been getting that same? He, he yeah. has, and I. He was with me uh, as I raised this issue with others in Ukraine. I, the president wasn't the only person that I brought this concern, uh, this concern up with. Um, well, we were there, the, 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 our embassy in Ukraine told us that they had not been involved in these political demands of Zelensky. Um, and, you know, my, my interpretation of their, of their refusal to get involved was that they believed they were improper. Again, I'm now concerned that I didn't get the full story because the fact that Pompeo is now refusing to say whether the State Department was involved may suggest that there, there, there was some work being done by others in the Trump administration beyond the president himself. Did he ask you to do anything in particular? Like to, did he actually ask for your help to intervene? Or not on that, not on the question of uh, the Trump campaign's overtures. He did ask us to intervene to unlock the aid. Uh, he made a passionate case as to why Ukraine needed that military aid. Uh, and he asked us to, 
uh, ramp up our efforts to convince the president to change his mind. The aid was ultimately released, right? The aid was ultimately released after the it became clear, after the whistleblower complaint uh, was uh, was made. I, well, I don't know, but I'm very worried that we are going to start focusing on the question of whether there was an explicit quid pro quo. And that's why I said at the beginning, um, there is an implicit threat to every demand the president makes of foreign leaders. Um, and so to me, it doesn't matter whether the president you know, explicitly told Zelensky that he would lose his aid if he didn't conduct this investigation. The president should never be asking foreign leaders to interfere in American elections, period, stop. It doesn't matter whether there was a, an explicit quid pro quo. Um, what the president did was a, what the president has admitted to was a fundamentally corrupt act. A and Republicans and Democrats need to acknowledge that. What's your expectation as guarding the Foreign Relations Committee? I mean, you, you wrote them back in May or, or, or earlier this year and yeah. you said, please investigate this. And well, you're asking them again. Um, do you do you expect that there'll be some sort of hearings or some sort of oversight? I'm, I, you know, I'm not holding my breath that Mitch McConnell is going to, you know, open up an investigation of President Trump on this matter, given his reluctance to investigate any of the other Trump administration corruption. Um, but the House is investigating the Ukraine. Uh, matter. I think they have three different investigations uh, already open to understand the nature of the uh, election interference requests made by the administration. Okay. Uh, on the issue of um, your discussions with the Trump administration on background checks. Yeah. Um, this, com this complicates those matters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, I have not had any communication with the Trump administration since last Wednesday night when I met with the Attorney General. Um, I don't think that's coincidental. I think the White House has been in crisis management mode since the whistleblower complaint was made public. Um, and so I don't know whether the White House is going to be willing to re-engage on background checks um, given the crisis that is currently unfolding. Um, I thought the proposal that the Attorney General was making was a fairly good faith effort to bridge the divide on background checks. There were some things in it I think need to change, but it was a basis for negotiation. And, um, you know, I have told the administration from the beginning that I can't get all, I can't get all my Democratic colleagues to support um, a measure that's less than universal background checks. There will be many Democrats who will um, not be willing to settle for less than universal background checks. I think this is so important that we should be uh, willing to compromise. And if I get a call from the White House that they are interested in having negotiations over the bar proposal, um, I will be there. I will have that conversation. I, 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 I think I can you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm going to continue to lead um, uh, the outcry against the president's actions in Ukraine, but I also understand that if we have the opportunity to save lives by changing uh, the country's gun laws, uh, we shouldn't forsake that opportunity. What about the vapor pipe? I think the president made the, uh, you know, the president's uh, instincts are not wrong, that you need to start cutting down on uh, at least the ways in which uh, vaping is marketed to children. Let me ask. Are, what do you think the chances are at this uh, negotiation of background checks? I mean, given what the president said last Thursday, I think it was on, on Fox and Friends. Like but he says something different on guns every single, you know, every single day. Um, and remember, he says that he's, he continues to represent that he's a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. Well, so am I. And there's nothing inconsistent with strongly supporting the Second Amendment and requiring that everybody prove that you're not a criminal before you buy, uh, before you buy a gun. Um, you know, the president, now that the NRA has come out against the Barr proposal, uh, the White House has a difficult fundamental choice to make. They can only get a meaningful deal on background checks if they uh, take on the NRA. And I... I 
I think the Republican Party is at an inflection moment today where they realize that they can't stick with the NRA any longer, that they're going to get wiped out in Congress if they continue to do the NRA's bidding. But I don't know that they've figured out how to make that break yet. And, and that decision is in front of the White House right now, um, given the NRA's position on the bar proposal. There, well, I don't know, you're not going to negotiate with us, but <laughs> if your colleagues are unwilling to accept anything less than universal background checks, what are you willing to accept? Well, I, I think the focus, well, I mean, I, I can give you a little sense of that. I mean, I, I, at the very least, we need to be requiring background checks on all commercial sales. So these are sales that are advertised or sales that um, are done at a gun show. Um, you know, I, I would, I think the background check should be required for every private sale of a gun, um, regardless of whether it's advertised. Uh, and uh, so, so that's my, that's my baseline is that at least all commercial sales should be uh, covered. Um, and I, I think the, the essence of Mansion Toomey and the essence of the bar proposal, um, you know, meet that bottom line for me. If I advertise, I'm sorry, that'd be good. So if so, universal background checks means that you know even if you're selling a gun to a neighbor, um, you have to go through a five-minute background check. Um, when we say commercial sales, we mean a sale that you have put up on you know a, a gun that you have advertised on the internet, or a gun that you're making available uh, to uh, consumers at a gun show. You know, uh, essentially. A, a sale that you needed to, you needed marketing or advertising in some way to consummate. Um, and, and that's the difference between universal background checks, which we have in Connecticut. In Connecticut, it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're selling your gun uh, to a friend or you're selling it at a gun show, that sale needs to have a background check associated with it. How big of a chunk of the people that aren't going through checks would that be? So the number of sales today that aren't covered by background checks, it's hard to know. Um, but it could be upwards of 30% of gun sales, sales, not, not gifts or loans, sales right now happen through the private market. Um, and so of that 30%, I don't know that we, that we have good data to, to know how many of them uh, would not be covered by something like Mansion Toomey. All right, guys, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yep, thank you.